Um, so I'm going to assume that both of you can see my screen. If not, uh, yell at me at some point. If anything goes wrong technologically, just let me know. Um, <clears throat> all right. So the previous five chapters have been introductory in the sense that I think the first one was literally called introduction. And then the four after that have been basically feature engineering, have been taking text as unstructured sort of non-data and moving it into structured data. Um, so, you know, we've tokenized words and then once we've had those tokens, we've sometimes uh, used top words, we're looking at that, we've used uh, stemming, we've learned some limitization, that sort of thing. And so now we're going to learn how to incorporate everything we've learned so far into a tidy models framework. And we're going to start predicting things with these text features that we've laboriously created. And this week, we're going to look at regression, which in the machine learning world means that we have a continuous dependent variable. And next week, we have a wonderful speaker who's going to present classification. And that's not me, so. Yeah. So I think, I think this week and next week will be uh, somewhat similar, just with a different kind of dependent variable. Um, and I guess before I start, have either of you used tidy models before, or are you familiar with tidy models? It's this crowd participation model, so I need, hey. I, need to... I don't know if you can see me or not. I was, I was thumbs upping, oh. but. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah, me too. Okay, yeah, so. We we're both in that book club. Oh, then this week should go really fast because this chapter is really kind of like introduction to, like for the book, it's sort of introduction to tidyverse. So uh, that's good to know that uh, we, <laughs> this will be a relatively short meeting. Uh, okay, so I'll get into it. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the very first thing to do, by the way, let me know if the um, text needs to be bigger, um, is to, to load in the data and the tidyverse. So you'll see that um, this week's data uh, is called SCOTUS filtered uh, from the SCOTUS package, SCOTUS library, which was created by one of the two co-authors of this book. And it contains um, opinions written by uh, justices on the Supreme Court of the United States. So that is what Supreme Court of the United States, just in case uh, an acronym is unfamiliar to anyone here. Uh, and it's filtered because some opinions had less than a thousand characters. And so these are filtered uh, to ones that have over a thousand characters and uh, it's a random subset of them. Okay, so that's the data we'll be working with. Uh, it's the data of the chapter. So I, I was pretty lazy about that, very disappointed in myself. Um, so, all right, so um, before, before the initial fit, um, this is a, a graphic just from the, from the book. Uh, we're gonna see what, what kind of, I guess, coverage our data set has. Um, and so um, here they, they, I say they because I did not create this code, uh, bend the years into decades. And we have a nice uh, histogram of that. As you can see, uh, things really start, the court starts cooking really in the 1870s post-Civil War. Uh, one thing that they didn't remark upon that I found, uh, like, like if I were doing this analysis and I, I cared about it deeply, uh, I would note that um, the Supreme Court did not exist before 1790. Um, and so there are some of these cases that go over here. Um, so I, I looked into it and I, I think, I, I don't know, despite being a student of political science, I'm not sure like what jurisdiction the so-called Supreme Court had before 1790, but the Supreme Court as we know it, the one created by the America's constitution uh, was created in 89 and first met in 1790. So anyway, that's just a fun detail. Um, yeah, Justin. Yes. <clears throat> so um, looking at this um, um, representation of the data, 
So before we go to modeling, do you think, um, I don't know, in some situation, the data, maybe we need to uh, normalize it to look normally distributed or somehow, do you think this is a good shelf to go and start doing modeling or we need to like change the shelf or scale the data in some shape? What do you think? So, so I don't, uh, I would say no. Um, so this is a common, a common thing that, that people think data has to look normally distributed to model it. But um, the actual assumption of, of linear regression, which is typically when this is brought up, and which by the way, we're not actually gonna do linear regression here. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is that the, the data has to be, or is supposed to be, is assumed to be normally distributed conditional on your covariates. So, so anyway, so, so the answer is no. Um, yeah, I, I guess the answer is just no. Um, I don't know why, how this thing started where looking at raw distributions of data with, is thought to like give you insight. And I mean, it's good for EDA, but anyway. Uh, so there's that. Another thing I wanted to say is that I, I was, when I encountered this for the first time, I thought it was actually kind of a weird task, like predicting year, because typically, at least as a, a social scientist, aspiring social scientist, uh, year is thought of as an exogenous variable, as a, a variable that's independent of your system that maybe will affect the system. So it's weird to model year from a, a social science perspective, because it seems like if anything should be an independent variable, it should be year, not a dependent variable. So I, I had to not think of it as a social scientist and think of it as uh, a machine learning person where they do tasks like classifying handwritten digits, right? So um, I don't know if that's, I actually, I don't think that's something we'll do. That's something you learn how to do in like a deep learning class. You learn how to, you know, classify um, a, a set of pixels, an image into uh, either, you know, zero to nine. So that's the way I had to think about this in the end. And if you think about that classification task, you wouldn't expect necessarily any distribution of those numbers zero to nine either. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, so this section is basically introducing tidy models and text recipes. Uh, both of you are familiar with tidy models. Um, so, so you're familiar with this type of, of pipeline. Um, so here's one thing you can do. Actually, in the subsequent analyses, uh, this I, I added this filter later, so so don't worry about that too much. But um, this was me making the data better, I suppose, in some way, or more reflective of the task. Um, one thing that they remark upon in this interesting uh, pre-processing step is that they removed apostrophes because the random forest model, are, yeah, that they're going to run. Um, doesn't like apostrophes. Doesn't ex it just doesn't. It doesn't like apostrophes. So we had to get rid of those. So that's one thing that uh, I guess both of you as tidy models people have experienced. That sometimes, despite the fact that tidy models unifies a lot of the machine learning pipeline, uh, different models can complain in different ways, and they need certain pre-processing steps. Like um, uh, I think GLM Net needs you to encode all of your um, all of your categorical variables as dummy variables, whereas, for example, Xcubers doesn't. So anyway, uh, so, so this is that kind of pre-processing step, sort of a, an engine-specific pre-processing step that they're just going to go ahead and do. Okay, um, and so here's where things start getting textual. Um, so there's this library text recipes, and now that uh, may be new, or may not be, but it's certainly, I don't, I doubt that's covered in the uh, Tidy Models book. Um, so we are going to create a recipe. Um, so, okay, so just uh, I noticed before that we just did the train test split. So now we need a, a recipe for tidy models. Um, so we're just going to use text as our dependent variable, um, but we need to process that. So we're tokenizing, um, which you probably remember from our, our good days uh, or simple days. It was tidy text on nest tokens. So that's what that's going to do. Um, here's a pre processing, pre processing step I don't think we've seen before because um, 
I mean, this is the first time we're modeling the text, um, but it's selecting only the most, the thousand most prevalent uh, tokens, All right? So that's going to reduce our feature space to a thousand. Um, and then the matrix that we're going to have is going to be filled with TF IDF values as opposed to just frequency counts. And, and this is one that I'm not so sure about. So for SVM, for the support vector machine, which is the first model we'll run, they normalize all the, the variables. Now, um, this isn't a, um, a, a lecture about support vector machines, but you are supposed to normalize um, your, your variables for support vector machines, but it's because you can have vectors or uh, features on different scales. Now, in theory, and I haven't thought a lot about this, but it seems like every single explanatory variable we have is on, you know, wh whatever a TDF IDF unit is, they're all on that. So I'm not sure actually if we need to normalize, but perhaps they're just trying to instill a good practice, but um, nevertheless, that's uh, okay. So anyways, we have recipe, but because you two are both tidy models experts, I'm not gonna say anything about that. Um, I, I can see your faces now, and I see Lila just scowled at me. <laughs> so, uh, so feel free to comment. Feel free to verbalize your scowls. If you <laughs> verbalize my scowls. <laughs> I my fit. My expression was, "Lord help me, I don't remember the tidy models." <laughs> that was um, my expression. So, the um, Justin, can you go over? Go up. Yep. So this step normalize. Um, all right. Okay. All predictors. So this is, I mean, a, a kind of transformation I was talking about to normalize uh, data to be somehow normally distributed. This one, which kind of transformation this normalization does? So um, even transforming the data to be normally is somehow transformation, right? So this normalization. What kind of, because we have different kind of normalization. So which one are they doing now on this data? Because normalization, yeah, that's the question. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So before, before I thought, and maybe before you did mean dependent variable, right? So year, um, that's typically what people say is they look at the dependent variable. They say, is it normally distributed? If not, maybe I'll take the log of it or the square root of it or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is different. So this step normalize, which I just scrolled past, uh, is is centering and scaling all the predictors. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it's so it's demeaning them and then dividing by the standard deviation. Uh -huh. So I think that there's a a scale function in I guess the stats package in R. Okay. So what anyway, was your? I don't understand. What was the SVM? Where, where does it say it's where in this recipe is support vector machines? So it's not. It'll be our model. So yeah. So, it, but it's but it's looking forward to SVM. That's why we do it. So for example, oh, the normalization you know, is for SVM. Exactly. So it, like we already we, know we are classifying with SVM. Yeah. Um, I think maybe. I'm not quite sure, for example, if we are using tree based models, it's not necessary for us to do normalization, yeah. tree based model. But for SVM um, uh, and other, you can do um, uh, normalization. So this norm step normalization is not specific for SVM, I think. Exactly. It's, norm it's, it's, norm it's general normalization. Ah. They, yes, general normalization, right. yeah. The, it, it's true. It's true. It's uh, so support vector machines. I just googled it. It says they assume that all the it is, as support vector machines assume all the data is in within a standard range from zero to one or negative one. So normalization of feature vectors prior to feeding them to SVM is very important. The process often called whitening, although there are different kinds of whitening. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. So I know I never heard whitening before. 
normalization, whitening, prescaling, they're synonymous. I, I have not either I just heard normalization, but I often forget what, uh, which, which models require normalizations and which doesn't matter at all. So um, all deep learning models, exactly. neural networks, they require. Thank you. New, yeah, neural networks, they want you to, the, to center your data. Yeah. So if you are using neural network deep learning, before you do, you need to, that's why I always say them, they take the log of data centering and stuff like that. So one of the ones that don't require that are basically um, tree-based models because they can extract the uh, stuff along okay, the so way. I just Googled it. I, I Googled it also. And theoretically, it's not necessary because the literature that I've read with, I've read with neural networks about neural networks, I don't, I've, from my understanding, it was you don't have to normalize, mm -hmm. but practice has this way it just goes on, on, on here. Um, it's good practice because it says when during training, it makes it more efficient, which leads to better predictions. It, it's basically just a way to speed up your, your training. And also sometimes improve the accuracy. Yeah. Leads for faster. Oh, because it, if it's normalized, it converges faster. Yeah, exactly. That's the accuracy. You have a logistic sigmoid function. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Or a mm -hmm. tan. Okay. Okay, that makes sure if it's a logistic sigmoid function, the activation function. Okay, anyways, it's going on a tangent. Sorry. Yeah, you guys, you guys went down an inverse tangent, inverse tangent rabbit hole. Inverse tangent rabbit hole. Inverse hyperbolic tangent. I forgot. That's the nerd. That's the... Nerd alert. Just kidding. Yeah. Person who spins. Person who spins a minute talking about normalization calls someone else in there. that's a podcast. Bro, I've been I've been working on slides on probability and so I have all these distributions like in my head right now and I am like probabilistically and and linear algebraically out okay all right all right I'll try not to mention I don't think there'll be any linear algebra or anything any, anyway Okay, so, so now we're gonna go back to tidy models. Uh, we've created the recipe. Um, and now we're gonna put that into a workflow. Um, so workflow is just a nice way to package both the recipe and the model, um, the model which we don't have yet. So you notice that when we print out the workflow, uh, there says model is none, but we do have the preprocessor, which is the recipe, uh, which tokenizes, filters the most prevalent thousand, makes it to TF IDF, entries in the matrix and normalizes those, those calls. Um, Justin, do we have step um, embedding? Yeah, word embeddings exist in this. Uh, so they don't, and just to, I guess, spoil it for you, I hope you don't log out immediately, but uh, they don't do word embeddings in this chapter. So I don't. Oh, okay. So, so, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, but I do believe the one of the co-authors, Emil, Dutch last name. That's how I refer to him, Emil Dutch last name. Um, he has a blog post on using word embeddings uh, with tiny models. He has what? A blog post. So he has a, a blog that's okay. it's pretty good. He doesn't update often, but it's a good bookmark to have. Okay. Um, okay. So, so now that we have the workflow, um, kind of put it to the side for just one second. Uh, and make specifier model. So we're going to use a support vector machine with a linear decision boundary. Sorry, that was a bit of linear algebra there. Uh, so it has a linear decision boundary. Uh, we're doing regression as opposed to classification. I believe its default is classification. And the particular library we're using is libLinear, <laughs> capital R. It's very important. Um, all right. So now that we have our specification or the model, we're going to add that model to the workflow and we're going to fit it. Uh, and this is what we get. So um, this is a bunch of code to make it not look so ugly. Uh, it still kind of looks ugly, but this is basically 
we have a um, you know, very exploratory situation here. So what these are, are the extracted coefficients from the model. And if it's a, a positive magnitude, that means it's predicting later in time. If it's a negative magnitude, it's predicting earlier. Um, so there are a couple of things to notice. Um, ought is the strongest predictor. And you can imagine, uh, and, and that's actually interesting to me uh, that ought is predicting newer. You know, I kind of would probably would have, if you'd ask, if you had asked me ex ante or before this was done, I probably would have said that I would predict, if anything, prior texts, but I would have been wrong. Uh, interestingly, you see, you see a stop word or what would typically be considered a stop word, uh, like but is the third strongest, most magnitudinous predictor. As is same, there's the, therefore. So this is going to be something we'll see later. This, this will be investigated, but a lot of the strongest predicting words are, uh, are stop words. So anyway, this is a nice thing about SVM. Uh, they give, it gives you somewhat interpretable results. Um, anyway, so this is just dipping our toes into it. So um, again, I'm speaking to two tiny models masters. So this is going to be review. Um, so if we were more serious about this task, uh, we wouldn't have just fit the model and the training data and kind of done this and walked away. What we would have done is done some cross uh, validation. We would have um, done some hyperparameter tuning. Uh, or, or we would have done it to get better estimates on our error. So actually, at the beginning, we're not going to tune anything. I will tune later. Uh, but anyway, OK. So. Um, so this, we take our training data, we get, uh, I believe it defaults to tenfolds. Um, so we're gonna get tenfolds here. And then we use a fit resamples function um, on the workflow with the model, and we have our folds. And this, this is gonna be very important, uh, saving our predictions. So these are the out of sample predictions. And um, so we do that, it takes a while to run. Um, we can collect the metrics. So this is something that we could not have done earlier. So now that we've, now we have some out of sample observations, we can see how good our model did. And so we have a root mean squared error of 15.6. So we can interpret it. So since that's on the scale of an infinite variable of years, uh, we know that our average, you know, we can expect to be plus or minus 15 years, which is, I don't know. I don't know if that's good or bad. So there's 200 years of data basically 15.6 off. Um, although you, you see, this is pretty impressive. Uh, the R squared is 0.9, so uh, which is impressive. And to visualize that, because you know that's a squared correlation basically uh, between these two things, between predicted and truth, you see that that does look like a, that's pretty good, pretty good correlation there. Um, and you see that there's not a lot of, and this this would be an important um, thing to look at for linear regression to see that. The, you know, the errors are uh, what you call homo scedastic and just normally distributed around the predicted line. Uh, so you see that, that, would, that would be pretty good. You see that at the uh, lower years here, years that mostly shouldn't be there, uh, you know, you do get some, you do get this kind of tail where you're not under predicting anything. But given that the data is pretty sparse here, uh, I wouldn't worry about that too much. So anyway. So this is a nice, uh, so this collect predictions function is, uh, is pretty nice. Okay, uh, this is an interesting section that is very short. So this, I had, before I read this chapter, I had never seen this parsnip function, a null model. So you can actually get the null model. Um, so as opposed to SVM before is what we did. So this does, or takes our SCOTUS workflow and gives it to a null model, which is just gonna uh, predict the mean observed year in the data set. And in all in all, this takes like 10 minutes to run. And it's something you could get with uh, about 30 seconds of coding. So um, the only thing that you get from running all this is a standard error on the mean. Uh, so I'm not, and in the book, I don't, I don't think they really justify why, <laughs> why you'd want to do this. I mean, it is good to compare your model to the baseline model. 
Um, and you do see, so here the root mean squared error is almost 50 years, 48 years, uh, compared to all models, uh, root mean squared error of, or sorry, yeah, of 15.6. So, I mean, it is certainly better to have the support effective machine model than the null model, but there you go. I don't know. I don't have much more to say about that. Um, more interesting is to compare our support vector machine to like a real competitor model. Um, so they're going to use uh, a random forest, a thousand trees, uh, fit with the, the ranger engine. And uh, this is pretty much the same. So we have our specification now of the, the random forest. And so now you see also why we didn't build the um, didn't build the support vector machine into the workflow. So now what we can do is just take this pre-processing step and pipe it into uh, the random forest model. So, so that's kind of the, the reason for that. <clears throat> um, and then so this is the same as before, just now it's with the random forest specification. And we see that we've actually decreased ever so slightly. We've decreased our, our median squared error. So it was 15.6, now it's only 15. And it's pretty precisely estimated, so the standard error is pretty small on that. Uh, but the residuals pattern looks pretty weird. So you'll notice here that, uh, first of all, we do get the same kind of uh, flare in here, this kind of upward flare. It's the lower set, it's the lower end of the, the years. But then there's this strange discontinuity here. Um, at about 1925, 1930 or so. And so the residuals have a very weird pattern to them where um, you notice that, so if you, if you imagine like a best fit line before 1930, it would be too flat, right? So you, kind of, you sort of have two, two flat, and it's T-W-O-T-O-O, -O, two, two flat lines. And then it kind of says like, oh crap, I'm too low here. And then goes back up and is again too flat later. Um, so, and what's interesting is in the book, they just say, well, this looks weird. So this is a worse model. So we're gonna go back to the support vector machine. Now, given that the task is prediction, you know, I'm not sure how much we should be worried about these residuals, but, um, but, these, but those are both more experienced researchers than me and they say, this is a worse model. Despite, despite the actual, um, I mean, bo both of these, it, it performs better on both root mean squared error and uh, R squared, which if it performs better on one of those, it's gonna perform better on the other. So those, that's not really two separate data points, but anyway. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so uh, that's any questions before I go on. In case you're wondering what the different colors are, that's for the 10 different folds. So there are 10 different colors here. It looks like a bowl of Fruit Loops. Um, and anyway, so that's what they are. It's not particularly informative to know that. So actually, that's the way it's displayed in the book, although they have a nicer color palette. Uh, for the other one, I colored it by residuals, which I think makes a little bit more substantive sense. But I'm a very opinionated person, I guess. Um, OK. So Rain of Forest, that's going to be discarded, which is sad. I, I, I wish I had more time in my life and I would discover what the cause of this discontinuity is because it's very sharp and it's weird that there's only one. Um, and yeah. I think, uh, you know, trees. Maybe <laughs> if we unnormalize the data and see what will happen with random forest. <laughs> well, so this data, this data is normalized. Uh, the uh, dependent variable is not, the regressors, the features are. Um, that shouldn't matter, but uh, I don't know. All right, all right, so I'm gonna move on. Um, so here's, so now we're gonna talk about incorporating the, the things we learned uh, into, the, into these models. So, and we're also gonna see some, what I would call tidy models jujitsu. Some, some more advanced tidy model stuff. So this is gonna be one case where, um, um, go ahead. Um, how I wish tidy model can be extended to deep learning framework. <laughs> <laughs> it does not support right now, right? I know that, that you can use the Keras library. They have various functions from Keras. Um, 
which I have never used Keras. Like the only time I've done deep learning stuff has been with Torch, PyTorch. Oh, uh, PyTorch. Yeah, but uh, I don't think they have Torch support. Um, but but yeah, no, but they definitely. I think that there's definitely deep learning, and and I assume that. Uh, I mean, Sean, you're presenting that chapter. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll see. It. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's definitely okay. some deep learning support. I assume it's, well, I was going to say, I assume it's rudimentary, but I shouldn't say that without, without knowing. Okay. Uh, okay. So, okay, so we're going to look at some, how to remove stop words. So in, in one way, uh, removing stop words is very basic. You just add this step, um, which is step stop words, and you apply it to your text column. Um, but, but here's, but what they're going to do, and what I, was referring to earlier as tidy models jujitsu is they're actually going to create a, a wrapper or a helper function that just contains the entire recipe and where you put in the stop word uh, dictionary they, they refer to the stop word name and it's going to pass that to stop word source argument of step stop words um, and so with that relatively concisely you can say, you know, I want my snowball uh, three samples, right? And so what you do is you just have your, again, the same old support vector machine workflow. Um, ah. And then you pipe that into the recipe. So notice that it's, this is reversing it. Earlier, we had a workflow that only had a preprocessor. Now we have only, now we have a workflow that only has a model. So I guess that's a, a thing to notice. And so what we're doing is we're taking that, um, Preprocessor lists workflow, piping into the preprocessor, which we're going to use our um, stop word rec function, stop word recipe function that's created. And we're going to fit the same support vector machine with uh, three different stop word dictionaries. So, um, anyway, go ahead. Sean. What is the rationale of using different um, seed word here? Different seeds? Yeah. Uh, I guess just, I mean, right, beyond why, why not just set one seed for the whole thing? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm trying to think. Like, if I just ran this all as a chunk in R, uh, like in a markdown, I know that the seed is somewhat persnickety. So I'm just not sure. Like, I'm not sure if it would be reproducible to just set the seed once. I think it would be, but I'm not sure. That, that's the thing is I, I don't know if it would be reproducible to set the seed once. Now you could ask what would be the purpose of setting it to one, two, three, two, three, four, three, four, five. No, different seed five. like, yeah. I mean, just, <laughs> we, why don't we like just have one at the top, it to run down, yeah. I don't know, I don't know, but I don't, it's not a big deal, but mm -hmm. it is a good thing to be curious about. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't even know why they set different speeds for each model. Maybe it has um, something to do with you are pulling from the resamples every time. Um, and you want to assure that there isn't um, any chance of Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Damn. I can't remember, but you know, like the seed, like there's, it's like a number, right? It's like a, in the background, it's like a random number generator that yeah. creates the seed. So you want to, I guess, assure that there, the randomness maybe might be there when you're, pulling from the resamples, even though you're using the recipe, like you're applying the recipe on different words. I mean, the different, sorry, stop word libraries. I don't know. Okay, I forget what I just said. It makes absolutely no sense. Uh, I think that the key thing is that none of us know. <laughs> But I think that 
the, the more important thing from the perspective of this chapter is that it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, okay, so I'm trying to think. Um, this is a bunch of code that I'm not going to go over, um, but it's just to basically, it's all code to make the following graph. <laughs> and this is the following graph. Um, yeah. So what we see is RMSE plus, um, plus and minus one standard error. Uh, for the three libraries. So snowball the left, smart, and then stop words ISO. So um, I, anyway, so I made a slight modification to this graph from what the book had. Um, so you'll see that snowball performs the best. Um, but then I added this dot, 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 but none performed better, none performed as well as removing no stop words. So this bottom line here, is the RMSE for removing no stop words plus or minus one standard uh, error? So, in fact, they all perform much. They all perform more similar to each other than to the model where we didn't remove stop words. So, I think that this might be the first time in the course where we've seen not removing stop words being beneficial. Um, and so, obviously, if you want to do something like make. <laughs> God forbid, make a word cloud, which, you know, whatever. Uh, you would want to remove stop words um, just for, for human consumption. But uh, for this model, stop words are pretty important. And so I was, I was thinking about this, and I was wondering, you know, of the of this model, so this is the model, again, support vector machine that kept the 1,000 most prevalent tokens, what kind of things are going on? This is kind of just an ugly, ugly little tipple printout. Um, so of what's kept in there, 5.7% uh, of the things are numbers. And then now more pertaining to this, this graph, in the original model, 11% um, of the words used are stop words, uh, are snowball stop words. You know, 25%, 26% are smart stop words, and a full 35% are stop, stop words ISO, or well, ISO stop words. So, so they're pretty different lexicons, really. Um, these these models are. In any case, and also it's worth noting that not only does removing no stop words have the best, you know, produce the best model. There's this what you call monotonic increase deep decrease in performance here. So the more stop words we remove, the worse the model does. So um, okay. the more stop the more stop word you remove the more worse the model is. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is root mean squared error. So obviously it's something we want to be as low as possible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that increasing trend is decreasing performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so that, that's an interesting thing. But if you think about it, um, it actually makes a lot of sense, at least to me, because over 200 years of the English language, the just the way people write has changed quite a bit. So stop word prevalence uh, seems like it would also change the distributions of stop words over time. So, anyway. um, and in fact, I believe there's a post on Emil Dutch last names site where he almost advocates for using stop word only models. So that's an interesting, an interesting thing to check out. Okay. Um, so another thing we can do. Um, so before we were varying stop words. Um, now we're going to vary in grams. And well, anyway, um, this section actually doesn't have any output, which is kind of strange. But um, well, no, I won't get into that. So. Here we're going, so they're going further down the tidy models jujitsu. So we, we do something very similar to what we did before, where we have an ingram recipe. So all that is is the recipe with um, where we can specify from sort of the outside what our ingram options are. And so just like, um, well, actually this is a, a, a function we've seen before. So um, step tokenize instead of saying token equals word, 
say token equals in grams. And when we do that, we have to um, specify what options. Now, what does that mean? I'm actually going to skip this block for a second. Um, what it means is that we need to give it a list because this list is going to be passed to options. And where in is the maximum gram. So this would be just exactly the same as doing tokenizing by word. When we say list equals n equals one. And um, then when we say n equals two and min equals one, does anyone want to guess what that is? Make this a bit more participatory. And like if so, keep in mind that this here, list n equals two and min is one one, it's going to go here. Like that's where it's going to go in the function. So it's going to go inside step tokenize, hex column, token is in grams here. We can all, anyone who wants to guess. Um, all right. <laughs> so I was looking at this that you made mention, these options that we need to specify n-gram options. So what by specifying the token is n-gram, why do we need this argument, these options? To give at least one? Think about yeah. what, so n is a variable. <clears throat> so what, so what, what, for example, this is doing. It's gonna be the length say, of the gram. Yeah. So this is saying that I want bigrams and unigrams. Okay. Yeah, maybe you can specify different the minimum and maximum. So that's okay. we'll pass so this one to that. Okay. The third one would be unigram, bigrams, and trigrams. Yes, that's exactly what it is. So I actually um, I realized the answers are kind of right here. I didn't notice that until just now. Um, no, I got the I got n equals three, n equals one, two, and three. I just was confused about what n min, what the n min argument was. But then when you said that it, it's actually, when you pass in the list, it's actually like a range for n. So one, yes, two, yes, yes. that means unigram and bigram. So now. I'm yes, sorry. yes, yes. Yeah. Now, one thing that I'm uh, unsure about, and I don't know why we want to do this, I just don't know if it's possible to do, like, for example, unigrams and trigrams and not bigrams. But I mean, perhaps that's nothing, that's something that no one would ever do. So, so right. did you say, are you asking, like, if you can just skip bigrams without doing and then just do, you know, I feel like you could. I think it's circumstantial. So, whatever is contextually relevant that you're looking for, if it's more contextually relevant to, look at phrases that contain you know three words like you know i feel bad versus just bad because bad is how you feel then you would want the trigram versus feel bad because it also has a subject which is you, whoever is referring to so it's like the your subject your adjective and your verb Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, I get that. I guess. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know. But yes, context specific. I um, see that again. Set C thing. I'm like very perplexed by this. I, I really want to know why they. I would really. I really want to ask him. Do you think we can? since you have this, or actually it's in the book, duh. Um, I think I'll post it on Slack and tag him. Like what, what is the motivation behind setting this three different seeds in between? Because most, everything, I, I was Googling it and I, everyone is just like, you set the seed once at the top of your script, so it's reproducible. And that's all, exactly. that's all for exactly. forever. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, thing, the thing I would look at, uh is like depending on how so they wrote this in book down i assume and uh i just i don't know like if you set a seed in one chunk for example does that mean that that seed is now set for another chunk 
Like, what if oh. you set it in one chunk, run a chunk like two down, and then go back up to the one where yeah. you have, like, it seems mm -hmm. like you would need it set. You would set it chunk. with the global options where you load the packages, but the, like the setup chunk, otherwise you're right. Like the chunks are a little bit isolated. Uh, yeah. actually, no. Uh, no, so, but even in this particular chunk, it's it's three times. <laughs> right. That's what I don't get is why it's multiple times in one chunk. That that's the thing I don't get. Yeah, I I I, I really want to understand the motivation behind this one. Yeah, maybe we can tag him. He's in our channel in the yeah, Slack channel, exactly. in the this book channel, so we can ask. Yeah, let's let's ask him. I'm very curious. Or you can ask Julia. I, I just want to say it's possible that Julia wrote this section, so I don't know. Um, okay, so um, there's actually, like I said, there's no output, which is kind of weird. Uh, I wanted, to, I just didn't have time to like make the output myself by comparing these models. What I will say is that the time required to fit these models is uh, a lot higher, the trigram model. So pulling out not only unigrams, not only bigrams, but also trigrams takes quite a bit longer time. And one interesting thing that I don't believe they discussed would be, so notice that when we fit, when we have unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams, there's an interesting things that are gonna happen. Like one, we might get a lot of redundant information. Like, um, so not exactly the same information, but sort of redundant information, like having unigrams and bigrams that kind of overlap or, you know. Um, there's that, and also there's the fact that notice that our max tokens are not increasing. So, so basically, the feature space is going to be a thousand, regardless. In this, in the way that they've written it, regardless of whether or not we have bigrams or bigrams and trigrams. So I, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, um, but it is. It's what they have. And yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely, like. Um... Bigram will contain more words, you know, contain more information than the unigram. And also like uh, if we have a thousand of, okay, in the first case where we have first unigram, then if we have set of 1000 words, and what about the second case? We have bigram and unigram. So this one will contain more information relevant, maybe, I don't know, than the unigram. And me, I'm not sure I give better performance than the unigram, the bigram that include the bigram and unigram. Yeah, but what do you think about the fact that, so so one thing that I, that I wanted to see that would have required some, some work, some like digging into the mechanics of these things, is see actually what the, just for example, in the trigram model, figure out what the distribution of unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams is, mm -hmm. right? Because a, a thousand tokens is fixed. Mm -hmm. So of those a thousand, what proportion are each in each of those three bins? And mm -hmm. my suspicion would be that almost every single trigram that makes it in. So first of all, trigrams would be a pretty small proportion. But second, um, that they would be basically like very general strings of like three stop words, um, or you know, two stop words and one sort of substantive word. So anyway, that's the type of thing that I wanted to dig into more, which uh, sadly I didn't do. Uh, so okay, so I'm gonna move on. So so six and six point six and six point eight, I sadly wasn't able to do because I had problems installing Space ER onto my computer. It says no Python. I do have Python on my computer, but um, so six point six is about limitization, and limitization uses uh, Space ER for part of speech tagging, which is necessary for that. Uh, and 6.8, I can actually just go ahead and say what 6.8 was. 6.8 is about, um, it's titled something like which metrics are appropriate. And funny, and a funny thing about that chapter is they don't actually discuss which metrics are appropriate. Um, they just tell you that in addition to root mean squared error, there's uh, mean absolute percentage error and mean absolute error. And uh, they don't really go into why you would use one over the other. So it's kind of a letdown section, but I guess the book is still in progress. Um, so anyway, so 6.8 is not extremely useful. Um, so yes, is that. All right, so the most bizarre, sec ah, we're out of time. Let's see, what should I do? 
hash. I'm going to scroll down. So feature hashing is a very interesting thing. Um, but I'm going to scroll past it for a second. And just in the last minutes, um, I'm going to go lightning speed through stuff that we've basically seen before. OK, so they, here's the final recipe. The difference now is that for the first time, we're going to tune something. Um, we're going to tune the max tokens argument. So you know, remember before that we capped it at 1,000. Uh, now we're going to go from 1,000 to 6,000 tokens. So that's the only difference here. OK. Um, then there's a SVM spec, so support vector machine. And one thing that I deleted here, but when I originally fit this, I also tuned the uh, penalty parameter. So that is a hyperparameter for support vector machines. Um, we'll see the non-effect that that had later. Okay, so workflow, we're bundling our recipe and our model together into workflow. Bam. Now we're going to tune the model. Okay, so what does this do? So we're going to tune both tokens from 1,000 to 6,000. And we're going to tune this cost, this cost parameter, this penalty parameter. So what that means is that, so for example, we're going to run six models at this cost parameter. We're going to run the same max tokens, uh, but now at a higher cost parameter and all the way up. So it starts out at this really small value, basically one one thousandth, and it's going to go all the way up to 32. So it's um, quite a big range for cost. Yeah. What is the, remember me, the hyperparameter cost in random forest? What is that? I forgot. So it's, this is for support vector machine. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's basically reducing the model's flexibility. So. Go on. Uh, so anyway, so we tune the grid. This takes a while to run. Um, but uh, there it is. And so now to evaluate it, we can have this nice like metrics. And what you see is that, so here, oh, wow, nice. So I told you that the highest cost is 32. I wasn't, wasn't joking around. There, there it is. Um, and we see, so we have a bunch of different costs, a um, bunch of different max tokens. And for each one, I just selected out the mean absolute error. We have uh, the estimate of the absolute mean absolute error for that particular configuration, that hyperparameter configuration. OK, so this is, the mo this is what they show in the book. Um, so in the book, they didn't tune the cost parameter. And I suspect I can show you why they didn't bother to do it. Um, but what you do see is that the models that we had been working with, the 1,000 token models, were actually not the best. Um, they were the worst, in fact, of the ones that they looked at. So they all have the highest, um, let's see, this is, I think it's root mean squared error. Um, so they start off all high. Oh, no, here they are. It's fasted by metric. OK, so, um, so yeah, so you see it starts off at 12 and it dips down. And once we get to uh, about 4,000 tokens, we're not getting any improvement. So that's something interesting to note. Um, and then here, there's this really nice auto plot function that you can put uh, resamples into, resampling object. And so this is, this is, I thought, very interesting to notice. So we're still fasted by metric. Um, it's kind of redundant because they tell the same story. Um, but what's interesting to note is that across the cost, so hugely varying, like orders of magnitude, there's absolutely no difference in model performance. I mean, these are just straight lines. So what I would have expected naively is that there would have been quite a bit of movement vertically, but there's none. And there's actually so little movement that I'm a little bit suspicious of. I mean, this, this should not have happened. Um, these are huge differences in the cost parameter and just made no difference. So unfortunately, this will really be kind of a mystery that remains. Um, now that I'm basically out of time, just uh, here's a nice uh, tidy models function uh, from the ooh, we'll package with that for the tune, maybe. Um, anyway, so you select your best model and but you select the simplest one, basically, uh, within a given range of accuracy. Uh, you finalize the workflow. You get this. You fit it the last fit. So there's a bunch of tidy model stuff going on here. And then um, we get a graph very similar to the one that was, we saw earlier, except they facet by positive and negative, where I just did colors earlier. Uh, we go down. We can look at the similar. We can look at the same graph we had earlier. Now this is on the test set. We see good performance, I would say. And, and lastly, they show you how to look at like um, sort of like post hoc EVA. 
uh, which is actually really useful. And discover they discover useful things. But you see, for example, some things are really uh, mispredicted. Like this one that actually came out in 2012, this course that was looked at, decided in 2012, uh, was predicted to be decided in 1888. So you see some, so when you want to like investigate certain mm -hmm. mistakes. Anyway, so uh, sorry I had to rush so much at the end and skip over some stuff in the middle. I guess we can talk about uh, if we just want to skip those things or talk about them next week. Um, I don't know if we'll do that in the Slack since we've already gone over. All right, that's it for me. All right, but thank you, Justin. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely want to know the whole seed thing and then, well. Yeah. Um, well, all right, real quick. So, so what should we do next week? We want to move on to classification or? Yes. Or I guess, yes, okay. Classification. So next week we are going to have Layla, I think, I guess, right? For classification. Is that <laughs> all you, right. you hope? <laughs> you hope you're going to do classification next week? Yeah. See if I'm not a blubbering mess. Do we, do we I, my term is ending, so I have like 500 deadlines coming up. No, no worry. It will be in, in, in Python. It will be in Python. Next we want your presentation Python? to be in Python. OK. <laughs> OK. Thank you all, and see you next week. That's great. Bye. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, too, for coming. Bye.